Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, today. First of all, let me go back to the first slide. Um, yeah, um, we are very proud uh, to have this workshop today. Um, we have more than 1,100 registrations. Uh, originally, the workshop has been an, uh, uh, designed uh, for the users, specific workshop for the users of the ES digital ESD, ESG data, but uh, it turned out we also get many, many registrations from other people, also preparers uh, and so on. So we decided to broaden the scope a little bit. And uh, yeah, now it's my pleasure to announce that Chiara Del Prete, our chair of the sustainability reporting tech, will also make an uh, uh, introduction. And yeah, Chiara, Chiara, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. I will be brief because we are a little bit ahead, late in the schedule and I don't want to uh, reduce the time available for your uh, uh, discussions. First of all, thank you for uh, the interest in participating to this consultation. Uh, we are very uh, pleased uh, um, of having completed this uh, important uh, deliverable in our work plan. Uh, the taxonomy, digital taxonomy for uh, set one of the uh, ESRS, the standards that were adopted as delegated act by the European Commission is an important achievement in our uh, uh, work plan and uh, respond to the logic of advancing uh, the uh, digital reporting broad sense. Um, uh, this is uh, seen as an important enabler for uh, uh, the uh, usability of the data uh, and uh, uh, we uh, we hope to uh, support uh, to advance uh, in uh, in that uh, in that direction. Uh, this uh, will be benefit both the users and uh, uh, the preparers, and we see more and more growing interest in sustainability reporting and sustainability data. So the fact that they are now use uh, available also uh, in a digital form will. Uh, is expected to, to, to help both preparers and uh, users. This consultation uh, is uh, also covering uh, uh, Article 8 of uh, the EU uh, uh, environmental taxonomy, which is uh, uh, quite a, a specific uh, uh, content of disclosure um, for which EFRAG has not been the developer of uh, the uh, standards themselves or, or the templates, but simply the technical uh, body that uh, has uh, translated into uh, the XBRL language. Um, we are, we are, there are very specific questions in this consultation, but I would say one of the aspects that is very important to emphasize uh, is the innovative nature of the approach that we are trying to promote here. Uh, in particular, considering that uh, uh, the um, vast majority of the information is narrative in nature. Uh, the effort that has been made by the standard setter in 2022-23 in drafting the standards, sorry, until 2022, has been to structure the requirements as much as possible uh, in a way that would facilitate the tagging. So these uh, uh, standards have been uh, uh, from the inception, thought and designed in a way that they would have been digitalized. Of course, we are eager to know the feedback of the uh, um, broad community um, on this uh, uh, on this approach. And so, the, also the digitalization that has been proposed here uh, reflect this uh, uh, this uh, this approach, and the same also with. Uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, booleans and other semi-narrative uh, elements that have been uh, um, included in uh, uh, in this uh, in this taxonomy. Uh, what EFRAG has released in these uh, uh, documents uh, is uh, the what EFRAG considers the most appropriate way to digitalize uh, these standards. Uh, the final say will be in the hands of uh, the Commission and ESMA, who will run another consultation on the detailed tagging rules. Uh, but as uh, um, uh, EFRAG is uh, the advisor in drafting the, those standards, 
uh, has issued this uh, document as the most appropriate way to translate digitally this disclosure. So it's important to note this as a general uh, assumption. I don't want to take other time, so I leave you in the expert hands of uh, Richard Bass and Andrea Giannini and the rest of the team. Uh, let me express the gratitude once more to the members of the Digital Reporting uh, uh, Consultative Forum who advised us uh, in this context. Uh, it, it has been uh, very, very important to have you all on board. And thanks a lot to all of you that will participate to the consultation. The more you are, the better the final result. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chiara. Good, then let's start. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe let's uh, have a quick introduction for ourselves. So my name is uh, Richard Person. I am responsible at IFRAC for the digital, for the development of the digital taxonomies. And I'm here uh, with uh, uh, Andrea Giannini. Maybe you want to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Thank you, Richard, and good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the workshop. My name is uh, Andrea Giannini and I joined IFRAG uh, two years ago and uh, in particular was involved in the drafting of the European Sustainability Reporting Standard and working in parallel with Richard on the project of digitalization in the cluster nine. My contribution to the development of the taxonomy is more, I would say, on the human readable side of ESRS uh, and uh, in order to be uh, to be transposed uh, in a properly way in the in the digital uh, in the digital uh, uh, taxonomy. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, we have a tough agenda, so a lot of things uh, that we would like to show you today. However, if you have any question, please uh, feel free to ask it via Slido. Slido is a platform uh, that you can access by uh, using your smartphone and scanning the QR code or just going to slido.com and entering the code that you can see here on the screen. And uh, we cannot promise to be able to answer all the questions, but we will do our best. And we have a dedicated question uh, section also at the end of our workshop uh, in order to, to discuss uh, some of the uh, questions and comments. Well, uh, so please no, don't note down 29 is the code for slido.com and or scan, scan with your smartphone. Well, uh, first of all, um, let me give you a quick introduction into the um, ESRS set one draft X-ray taxonomy. Um, just at the very beginning, keep in mind the term taxonomy. We will explain a little bit later what it means. We are not referring to the EU taxonomy today, at least in most of the cases. Um, we are referring to the digital taxonomy. Unfortunately, both uh, terms are, are used in a very different way um, here. So uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, IFRAC received the mandate from the European Commission to develop the ESRS X-ray taxonomy, and it will be part of the ESEF RTS. ESEF is a European single electronic format that is uh, actually being used already today by publicly listed companies to tag their annual financial reports. And we will explain a little bit later as well, maybe even with a special guest, uh, what this actually means. The ESRS X-ray taxonomy is a um, digital transposition of the human readable European sustainability reporting standards, right? And um, this transposition process is actually what we are consulting on and what we are also explaining you how today, how we did it and how it now can be used since we have the draft available. The X-ray taxonomies can be used on one hand side by preparers to structure their report and to digitally mark up or tag the uh, sustainability disclosures or any kind of uh, disclosures, right? But on the other hand, uh, they can also be used by the users. And we use the term users unique uh, uh, for, for any investor or data provider, analysts. Uh, we, we consider that as a group of users of the digital ESRS uh, data or in general sustainability data. So just whenever we say users, we mean those that are actually supposed to use the digital ESRS data. And they can, of course, use the digital data itself, but the taxonomy as well. It provides a very important semantic contextual information uh, and can be used, for instance, to prepare databases and data warehouses. Good. Um, ah, just one, one organizational thing. We are recording uh, the session uh, just uh, for your information. 
Let's go with the legal background. Andrea, can you please provide us yes. some overview? Yes. Can you just, uh, okay, go to the other side? Okay. So let's briefly introduce the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which uh, represents uh, the current legal framework under which EFRAG operates, and uh, as uh, Richard mentioned before, so the CSRD were adopted in December 2022 with the main objective to create a common reporting framework and common standards in the European Union for the sustainability reporting. So the sustainability reporting will be uh, prepared according to the ESRS, that are the European common standards uh, that uh, were recently incorporated into the delegated act. And the sustainability statement are to be reported, this is important, in a clearly identifiable section of the management report. About the scope of application, as you can see in the slide, the CSRD has a broader scope than an uh, NFRD, so the previous directive. So all large undertakings would exceed some criteria, for instance, more than 250 employees are in the scope of the CSRD with a, a progressive phase in. So, uh, we start from the fiscal year 2024 uh, with a large listed companies and a large listed group, then from 2025 for the other large uh, undertakings and large groups in 2026 uh, for listed SMEs, and uh, finally in 2028 uh, with the non-EU countries. Uh, so, as you can see in the green box below, we are going to present the draft expert taxonomy that reflects the set one of ESRS applicable to large undertakings and large groups. Let's go to the other slide. So ESRS were adopted in July 2023 uh, by the European Commission and published in the official journal in December 2023. The slide uh, shows the composition of the ESRS articulated in two cross-cutting standards, ESRS 1 general requirement, ESRS 2 general disclosures, and 10 topical uh, standards which cover sustainability matters in the environment, social and governance. We have 82 disclosure requirements and more than 1000 data points uh, uh, that you can find also in the implementation guidance number three. ESRS 1 contains general requirements and do not include disclosure requirements. Nevertheless, we have also consider these uh, uh, general requirements in, uh, in the transposition of the elements into the experiment format. About uh, the next slides uh, and the uh, uh, CSRD and ESF uh, regulation, uh, CSRD has uh, not only introduced a new common framework for the preparation of the sustainability reporting, but it has all included the new provision in the accounting directive, so the article 29D on the machine readable format. So large listed undertaking and large group of uh, a large group shall prepare the management report in the uh, machine readable format and mark up the sustainability reporting, including the Article 8 of EU environmental taxonomy, in accordance with the ESEF format. So, based on this provision, ESEF regulation will be amended in order to incorporate the electronic format for the management report and the expert format for the sustainability report. Uh, just to uh, clarify, of course, the ESF regulation already requires an expert format for the financial statement and financial uh, notes of the issuers. Thank you very much. So now we have quite often heard the term digital and XBRL and taxonomy. And uh, in order to get a flavor of how our audience is actually educated in this, matter today we would like to start a slider poll so um yeah the slider poll is uh, uh, uh is active now so you can now uh, vote uh if you have heard the term xbrl uh, already or not and uh they just give us an indication that would be nice and uh i can see already a trend 28 participants 30. It seems we have a few experts here today, which is great. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, a few that have already um, 
experience with XBRL, but the vast majority seems to have no practical experience. And this is good because we actually also are going to explain you a little bit more in practical terms what this all means. Excellent. Thank you very much for voting. Uh, we will have more polls later on. Good, let's first uh, uh, present the consultation uh, material itself. So we have published on our uh, web page uh, on the 8th of February the XBRL uh, taxonomy, actually two XBRL taxonomy as Chiara already pointed out. Um, keep in mind that we have two separate consultations on the Article 8, this is now EU taxonomy related, and the ESRS, right? And uh, even if both will uh, in the end probably be uh, uh, tagged in the same annual uh, report, um, we have two separate consultations. And the reason is quite simple because those are based on two different disclosure requirements. And uh, yeah, that's the reason. This workshop today is on the ESRS and not on the Article 8 disclosure requirements. Uh, together with the XBRA taxonomy itself, we also provided a few non-authoritative co company documents. Uh, one is, of course, the XBRA taxonomy illustrated in Excel, and I will show it in a few seconds, um, in order for you to be able to, to uh, look at it, even if you don't have any XBRA software on hand, uh, which is able to, to open this digital uh, taxonomy. Then we have uh, illustrative examples of tagged ESRS reports as well. This is a very interesting uh, um, development. We tried our, so we actually tagged with our own taxonomy some mock-up uh, uh, um, reports having just random content uh, in order to test it and also to prove that it works. And we think it's very well, uh, can be used to educate uh, as well in terms of the consultation. And last but not least, the most important document is the explanatory note and the basis for conclusion. This is a PDF document and we spend a lot of time on, on explaining on and uh, providing details and background information on each of the individual uh, questions and decisions also on the methodology that we have applied. So if you uh, would like to better understand the background and the questions, please have a look at the explanatory note. Good. This is all available on EFRAC's webpage. I think most of you have probably already seen the, the link. Uh, um, there you can find all the information. Now, let's have a first look at the taxonomy itself. For those of you that have never seen an XBRL taxonomy, uh, you need to know that you actually need to have an XBRL tool in order to open an XBRL taxonomy. There is a, a, a wide variety of products available on the market, so we are not going to advertise a specific tool. You can use any compliant XBRL tool. If you don't know how to find those, uh, you can go to software.xbrl.org. There is a list of certified XBRL products, and you can be sure that uh, those tools can actually uh, process those uh, the XBRL taxonomies. This is uh, one screenshot on the left side of a tool um, that is called Arel. It's a free open source tool. You can use it to view, browse and explore a taxonomy. But for convenience purposes, we also provided the Excel file on the right side. It's just a presentation on illustration of the X-ray taxonomy itself uh, to make it a little bit more human friendly. Now, let's have a look at this. Um, so I just opened the XBRL taxonomy in RL, as mentioned. This is just one option. This is not uh, any recommendation by EFRAC, but uh, it's, it's, it's a good tool to browse an XBRL taxonomy. So this is how it looks like. As you can see, the XBRL taxonomy is structured in a way like the standard is. It has folders or, or roles in XBRL language that are reflecting each and every disclosure requirement in each and every topic. So it's starting with the cross-cutting ESRS2, minimum disclosure requirements, for instance, and then we have the E1 climate change standard with, for instance, uh, greenhouse gas emission reporting, the uh, uh, E2 on, on water and so on, pollution, social standards, it's all here. And uh, when I take a closer look, for instance, at E15, I can expand the so-called presentation link base and I see my first XBRL tag. 
The first expert attack that I can see here is a disclosure of energy consumption and mix. And here you can see the type is uh, of text block. So this is a narrative disclosure. This is a uh, attack that is supposed to span the whole uh, disclosure on energy consumptions. And then below you can find the uh, actual numbers that are required to be uh, reported in terms of uh, non-renewable energy production and so on and total energy consumption uh, that are here provided in the expert taxonomy and on the this column you can see each type right each type is a data type that is uh, precisely defined for each of the expert element so it's fair to say that each of the reportable uh, element is actually being uh, representing a, a data point as well. We have also alignment with the data point list. And on the very right, um, we also provide a reference to the standard itself. So the, this, this is, very, of course, very important if you would like to understand where this disclosure requirement is defined in the ESRS. So you can find a precise uh, uh, a paragraph number in the, um, uh, in the taxonomy for each of the XRL elements. Uh, or for or for most, I should actually say. Um, then on the left, you can see a little bit more attributes for an XBRL element. For instance, when I click on the uh, uh, total energy consumptions related to own operations, I can see this is a duration item type. Um, I can see all the references. There are multiple references in this case and the type and the ID. The ID is actually, uh, together with a Q name, the unique identifier that uniquely identifies this XBRL element. So this is a key point in XBRL. We have a unique ID for each XBRL element. This is how basically very quickly an X-ray taxonomy uh, works, right? We also have the same uh, provided in Excel. So this is the Excel output that we provided as part of our public consultation. And when you go to the role column, you can easily filter for, for instance, for the E15, and then uh, uh, also see the same information, or most of the information that you have seen in the uh, then in the XBRL tool. It gets a little bit more complicated in terms of disaggregation. So we also included a number of dimensions in our expert taxonomy that allow you to disaggregate information, for instance, by country, uh, by by uh, uh, if it's a target or uh, actually retrospective uh, reporting. So this is all part of the expert taxonomy as well. Great. So we also, again, uh, provided the tagged illustrative report. And this is now something on the screen uh, that you can see here um, for those of you that have never seen a digital XBRA report. And we also had a question in the in the chat I saw. Are we referring to XBRA or iXBRA, inline XBRA? And this is uh, something uh, very important to note. What you can see here on the uh, on the screenshot is an inline XBRA report. But this is uh, looks actually quite human readable, right? It couldn't appear like a PDF document. Uh, it's a human readable report, but inside this XBRA report, there is a tagging hidden usually for if you don't have a specific tool to display it. And it allows you to not only have the human readable layer of the report, but also have the digital layer, which gives each and every disclosure a semantic meaning, right? Um, I think the screenshots are a little bit small, so maybe let me go to a real expert report. This is an illustrative, it's not a real one, it's an illustrative report that we provided uh, for the E1. And um, for instance, what I can do here, it looks quite quite normal, like a normal PDF, for instance. Yeah, Just note that we only put a random placeholder text in here. I can look, now go to the, to the search functionality and put in total energy consumption, right? And then I see all the texts that are available in this report uh, uh, in terms of uh, total energy. And if I click on something, it will just jump to the right number in the report. So on this page, you see the energy uh, consumption and uh, uh, mixed disclosure, yeah, sample disclosure, with a lot of numbers and also some narrative explanations. And the magic of XBRL is that you can click on something and then you can see how it is actually tagged, right? So in, instead of just giving the, the human readable presentation, you have the precise uh, 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 information here, for instance, this is megawatt hours, right, and and uh, accuracy and so on, uh, in in the XBRA report, and this is called inline XBRA. 
Um, yeah, we also have uh, those illustrated reports for the social standards. So there are many, many examples uh, you can find, uh, for instance, this one here, remuneration matrix, uh, pay gap, and so on. Yeah, it's available on the web page, and I hope this explanation helped you a little bit to, to get the, the uh, context. Yeah, let's go to the timeline. Um, as we have now published our draft XBRL taxonomy and we are consulting on it, um, we will um, uh, finalize, of course, after the close of the public consultation on the 8th of April and then amend our draft XBRL taxonomy based on the feedback and the responses that we get. This will happen in uh, May and uh, June and we will go for an approval of the um, XBRA taxonomy in July. Right before the summer break, we will have an approval of the board, sustainability reporting board at EFRAC, and then we will hand over, as soon as we have the approval, the taxonomy to the European Commission and to ESMA, actually. And they will, so then actually our process is going to end, yeah, um, and, and then they need to take over and make the tagging rule. And maybe Eduardo from ESMA is here today. Uh, Eduardo, maybe you can elaborate just in a few sentences uh, on, on the process that will actually start once we have finalized our work. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Richard, and congratulations to EFRAC for the taxonomy, for the ESIS taxonomy. So what will happen after the receipt, uh, that ESMA receives the the EFRAC taxonomy, the ESIS taxonomy? So first, uh, we will analyze the taxonomy and to see how it fits uh, with the SF requirements, uh, in particular the architectures, but no worries because we are already closely working with uh, with EFRAC in this, in this area. And also we will assess the, the approach of uh, or we, we assess and propose the approach regarding the tagging of the sustainability reports, the tagging rules. As Kiara was saying, the EFRAC has developed the taxonomy with the most appropriate way, uh, considering the most appropriate way to digitalize the standards. But then, ESMA, we will uh, we will provide or propose the the, taxon the tagging rules of the sustainability reports, and also whether it will be necessary to have a facing approach regarding the level of tagging and uh, it, and. Um, and uh, Richard uh, Andrea will explain later what has been the hierarchy and the granularity of the taxonomy. So, but Esma will we will see what is the level of of tagging and maybe also regarding the scopes. Nevertheless, we are not going to do this in isolation. We will perform a cost benefit analysis. We will support these uh, tagging rules and facing approach, and we will do a public consultation as well, about two or three months. Which, following this consultation, uh, we will amend the draft uh, European Single Electronic Report format, the SFRTS, and we will submit to the European Commission with our draft SFRTS, uh, including which will include the sustainability report, the sustainability taxonomy, the ESRS, and the Article A uh, taxonomy for the disclosures. Then we will submit to the Commission, and it's for the Commission to to adopt the the final text. So uh, for the following steps, I don't know if you want me to give a, a word or something on this because I see it. I've seen that uh, there was some questions already in the chats about the when will be the mandatory uh, periods or the mandatory uh, files of the taxonomy. So it's not for ESMA to decide when it will be. It's for the Commission who will need to respond to these questions. However, uh, the Commission we, we already gave an indication on the when this was. Uh, going to happen. Uh, it was the Commissioner McGuinness in the speech of EFRAC. Uh, she already pointed out that uh, the digital requirements could only be in place for, to be compliant once there is a, a underlying taxonomy available and adopted by the European Commission, which means that uh, considering what uh, uh, is in the slide display here, clearly it's going to be very difficult to have for the financial years 2024, because after the delivery of uh, of the taxonomy to from EFRAC to ESMA, ESMA needs to do a public consultation and uh, have the following the due process, which means that we will only be able to provide this uh, final uh, report on the amendment, amendment amending the SFRTS to the Commission uh, by Q2. So, and we were having this approach considering the delivery was going to take place in June. So now I see that it's going to be in Q3. So we need to see how it's going to even move further in time and then it's one for the commission to see when they are going to adopt uh, but they also need to adopt 
uh, to follow the due process, which means that they need to do the translations in all the official languages, plus they need to have the scrutiny period of the parliament and the, and the council, then I think it's three months, which uh, makes also, it's, it's not for me to say, but it also it seems uh, that the, the financial year 2025 is going to be maybe a bit challenging for the implementation of the taxonomy. But this, again, this is uh, for the commission to, to be said. And I think that um, I, I hope they will provide a bit more uh, uh, views on this. Thank you very much, Eduardo. That was a very uh, a good summary. Yeah, and indeed, I think we saw a lot of questions, or not only here in the chat, but uh, generally we are approached quite often with a question: When is actually first year tagging? And uh, yeah, thank you for bringing a little bit more light uh, in, in this matter. But uh, yeah, just as uh, to summarize from EFRAC side, we we are just consulting on the taxonomy, and we can actually no provide no official statement when the when the taxonomy will be mandatory for tagging. Yeah. So the focus today is on understanding the taxonomy and to get ready to be uh, respond uh, uh, to the public consultation. Thanks a lot, Eduardo, for joining us. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope that was uh, very useful for everybody. And uh, yeah, great that you joined. Thanks. Good. Now let's continue with the highlights from our explanatory note and uh, survey uh, uh, questions. Now we have um, decided to pick a few of the most important topics from our uh, explanatory note where we also had the most of the discussions actually uh, with our tech and board members and also the DRCF members, the Digital Reporting Consultative Forum and um, uh, a few um, specific of a group of specific tech and board members that helped us to review the taxonomy. Okay, so as you can see, so the slide in shows an example of the digital transposition of one disclosure requirement that you can find in the ESRS2 and particularly related to the strategy of business model one and uh, how we have transposed this uh, the detailed requirement that uh, uh, is in the in the disclosure within the disclosure requirement into into the taxonomy. So uh, as you can see, there are a lot of arrows that represent uh, uh, the elements that uh, we have, in, we have uh, uh, implemented in the taxonomy. And uh, uh, even we have also included the, the, the data type classification for each elements that you can find in the, in the taxonomy, as Richard showed before in the, in the Excel file. Uh, and also in the in the in the tool dedicated to the to the taxonomy. In, in terms of the data type classification, we have uh, for the narrative disclosures so we have uh, identified the uh, the uh, three level uh, that correspond to the three level of the human readable ESRS. So level one is the main uh, is the full capture the full disclosure requirement. Then we have the level two, level three. So the most uh, granular elements that we have introduced and based on our also methodology that we adopted in April 2023 is the uh, corresponding detail requirement at the level of sub sub clause in the disclosure requirement. And uh, and uh, uh, so as you can see in these uh, in these slides, uh, there are a lot of elements that uh, represents the most granular uh, element at the level of sub sub clause. Then we have also uh, identified different uh, and uh, several numerical and quantitative uh, uh, data points and uh, and elements, and also uh, including the table. So in some case, uh, uh, as you might know, there are a lot of different breakdown that are required under ESRS, and we have implemented this requirement uh, through a, a dimension. In, uh, in these slides, uh, we have also mentioned the Boolean and we have the time to present uh, the semi narrative elements, but are quite uh, uh, important because we have introduced a lot of, uh, of these elements. So uh, this is just to, to, to give you an overview of uh, how we have transposed the, uh, all these detailed requirements into the digital taxonomy. And in particular, 
I don't know if Richard, you want to say something. We have also included the two questions related to the general architecture of the of the uh, of the taxonomy. Indeed, right. Uh, I'd, let me just add here that this slide is not because it might be very small for you to read it. This is not uh, here in order to to for you to read every line and to understand it, yeah. but it's just here to illustrate how we have worked. Right. We have carefully read each and every paragraph, every sentence of the ESRS and try to identify uh, uh, the corresponding data point and the expert elements that were resulting uh, uh, in the expert uh, taxonomy. Um, the narratives are, of course, an, uh, play a very important role, and we will also explain why. Keep in mind that the numerical items, right, the quantitative data, like the or the numbers, yeah, they are always implemented with the highest granularity. Yes. In the X-ray taxonomy, this is, of course, the most important from our point to be digitized. And uh, yeah, the, you can find more information in our methodology, like Andrea mentioned. And the the questions are actually then. Yes. Uh, those. Yes. Also, because. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have referred to the uh, to the data points, numerical uh, uh, narrative, but of course uh, the taxonomy includes uh, a lot of uh, different uh, technical uh, elements in, on, in order to be able to capture all the architecture and design of the entire ESRS. With the, we can uh, of course uh, uh, focus on the on the link between uh, the IROS policy action and targets how we have modeled. So there are a lot of uh, uh, of uh, the technicalities that we have implemented in our taxonomy, and there are two two main questions: so question one and question two. Uh, and here we expect to receive uh, general feedback about the design and architecture of the taxonomy, if they uh, adequately represent the SRS. And uh, uh, <coughs> so there is a specific question, in particular the question two, on the, if the taxonomy reflects also the needs of the of the users. So this is uh, also important because uh, the taxonomy, of course, serves in particular the interest of the users that uh, consume the data. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I already saw some question in the chat on the alignment with the data point list, because some of you might know that we have also published the data point list uh, as IG3. It's the implementation guidance number three. Can you elaborate, Andrea, how the relationship between the taxonomy and the data point actually is? Of course, so we, we have published the, the IG3 that uh, uh, is, of course, the, the list of data points uh, and the two documents, the, the IG3 and the taxonomy are, are aligned in terms of the identification of detailed requirement, but we have some, uh, uh, of course, some technicalities that are different. So we were not able in the Excel file to reproduce all the table, the dimensions, the breakdown, by, for instance, by countries, by GG emission. So there are some some differences in terms of the of the of these uh, uh, technical uh, elements that, uh, of course, we have uh, created in the taxonomy, but were not possible to recreate uh, in the in the implementation guidance no, number three. Then we have some uh, additional uh, uh, in detail about, for instance, uh, the use of weather and now. And uh, for instance, in IG3, we have uh, we have merged this uh, uh, into a narrative, uh, semi-narrative elements. Uh, and of course, in the taxonomy, we have implemented the two in two separate uh, uh, specific elements. Uh, one Boolean in general, the other one as uh, narrative elements. So of course, uh, also in the uh, we are receiving a lot of uh, pub public feedback. Uh, on the IG3, and we need to be in the, also in the analysis of this feedback. We need to uh, to be consistent in the list of data points and uh, also in the taxonomy because the IG3 the focus is try to um, mitigate uh, the the gap and uh, between the human readable preparation of the sustainability reporting and the machine readable format. So if the prepares uh, they can. Uh, uh, they are able to structure the sustainability reporting, taking into account uh, the list of data points, the IG3, the taxonomy. Of course, they have uh, the, uh, the, the the clearly and uh, uh, are able to capture also uh, the, the tagging from the taxonomy. Thank you very much uh, on this. Just a reminder, this the question that we show here is not to be supposed to be answered now. So just uh, keep in mind when you respond to the survey that is on our web page, uh, uh, you can find those questions and you can provide the responses. Yeah.
Good. Then uh, let's go to the next topic, the illustration of the narrative tagging hierarchy. The narrative tagging hierarchy is a very important topic because, let me explain you why. The uh, ESG disclosure requirements of the of the ESRS um, are about 60% narrative, 60-65% uh, are narrative disclosures or narrative data points. And uh, of course, the standard has been drafted in a way that we have uh, in each disclosure requirement a principle based data point, let's say principle uh, based description of what needs to be disclosed. But then we have very detailed data points that uh, describe what an entity needs to disclose actually. And so the narrative reporting plays a very important role. And the question was, how can we capture this in the XB Rail taxonomy? Well, we have implemented the hierarchy, as you might have seen already. Uh, so starting with the so-called level one tech that is capturing the, the whole uh, principle-based disclosure requirement. And then we have for each um, paragraph that requires a narrative disclosure, introduced one text block tech in our uh, expert taxonomy. And as you can see here on the left, we try to illustrate a uh, report. Um, keep in mind that also, of course, the numbers would need to be tagged in this uh, report, but we just omitted it here for the in order to not to overload the slide, right? Um, but this is how, in principle, the, the hierarchy works. So the orange ones are the most granular um, XPRL text level three and even uh, uh, the level two at the very end is a granular data point. Um, in terms of tagging of the full hierarchy, we came to the conclusion that it is not necessary to take the full hierarchy um, if the full content of a disclosure is is tagged with the most granular text so on the level two and level three then there's no need actually to add the parent tag as well because keep in mind when you do the tagging um then it would be in in, in the in the parent level you would just have the same information again and um, by using the expert taxonomy, a user like an analyst could also constitute the, the, the narrative disclosures of a parent by just by conjunction of all the narrative disclosures from the children, right? Like it's a tree. And um, the only issue is when you have disclosures, entities, additional disclosures to ESRS data points, something that is not exactly related to an expert uh, element in the report. And then, of course, um, this would need to be captured as well. It would be a shame if this would not be digitally tagged, right? So um, in this case, actually, it would be possible to use a parent uh, textbook tag, or we included a very specific other disclosure tag in our taxonomy. We will explain a little bit later how this other text looked like because we tried to make it as useful as possible. And um, yeah, then in this case, actually, it would not be required to, to uh, it would uh, be required either to use a parent or to use the other tag. But for the other cases, um, it's, it's not required to take the full hierarchy. The level one tag actually has a very specific meaning. Uh, we have mixed feelings about uh, this one being uh, very important for for tagging or not. Um, we think it's in useful in a way that it is it gives an indication that a disclosure exists in a report, but um, it's not necessarily providing all the uh, 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 to provide the real text itself um, because it's. First of all, tag with all the granular tags, and secondly, it might span multiple pages, right? This level one tag might span not only a few paragraphs, but maybe 10 or even 50 pages. We don't know. Yeah, It depends on the disclosure and on the company itself. So um, that's uh, why the level one tag plays an important role to identify where in the inline expert report the disclosure can be found, and that is actually, actually existing, but it, there's no need to produce an XPRL fact value. Yeah, for those expert experts that we have on the call from our perspective. Also considering that uh, the parent at the level one captured not only narrative disclosures, but even numerical numerical values, so uh, like the, the table 
Absolutely. But for the numerical values, let me repeat this. We, we think that the detailed tagging of each and every numer number right in the report, like we can see here, the revenue broken down by ESRS sector. Um, there we expect, of course, each and every number to be digitally tagged, right? This is very important. The text block tag cannot replace the digital tagging for uh, a detailed numerical quantitative data. Yeah, but uh, this was something that we heavily discussed and we think we found a good uh, solution and uh, uh, made a good proposal. Um, we, of course, have two questions here in our um, x uh, survey. Um, so first of all, do you agree with the hierarchy? This is uh, the, the, the main question. And second question, uh, we tried to reuse text block elements whenever possible and to avoid overlapping text because you can imagine that when you have uh, XRL elements in the taxonomy that have an overlapping meaning that it might result in a multi-tagging or double tagging multi-tagging of the same paragraph in an in an report and this is something that we uh, consider not needed when uh, uh, it's actually avoided that you have overlapping meaning in the XRL elements uh, in the taxonomy. So we also provided a few examples in our uh, methodology note where we did not implement uh, or reuse actually elements uh, in the taxonomy in order to avoid this overlapping. Yeah? So if you agree with this approach, please give a yes for this uh, survey question as well. Well, now we have already talked quite a lot about how we have modeled it and, and what are the fine details about the narrative tagging. Let's go and take a, a let's make a practical example, especially for those of you that have never tagged itself. Now, please watch. Um, yeah, imagine you have a narrative. We have written a narrative disclosure, a, a, a disclosure actually that is responding to the ESRS. And uh, I also saw the question in the chat, how do I actually tag it? Do I need to use a specific software? Yes, you need to use a specific software. And one way of tagging this uh, uh, report is actually to use a tagging tool, as I mentioned, on software.xrl.org. You can find a list of certified products that can do that. And um, those tools usually work like this, that you have on one side the, the report that you have written, and on the right side, um, you have the XBRL taxonomy, right? And then by doing drag and drop from the right side to the left side, a tagging can be done. So let me illustrate uh, how that works. This is how usually the tagging tools work, right? And once the tag is dropped on the tag, on the text itself, then the tagging is done. Keep in mind, this is a simplified example here. Uh, there are, of course, cases where you have, for instance, a paragraph that is not belonging to the text, text so it can be excluded or you can continue. You have one uh, section on this disclosure on page 17 and another one on page 23, so it's possible technically to, to continue a narrative disclosure then. Yeah. But keep in mind that the as the closer the report is to the actual taxonomy, the easier the tagging will be. So if the disclosures are actually scattered around in the report itself, the narrative, right, the harder the tagging will be. So our approach is, and we heavily recommend that to everybody going to prepare ESRS statements, to use the XRA taxonomy or the data point list to structure the uh, disclosures. Yeah, while drafting the ESRS disclosures, already look at the tagging. Yeah, imagine how it will be tagged, then it will be way easier to tag. Yeah, and this is uh, some approach that we even uh, uh, have, have developed further. We will explain it a little bit later. Um, just for completeness uh, sake, um, let's have also an example how to tag uh, numerical elements. This is just an illustration how it's done in some tagging tools. Um, so usually when you have, for instance, a table with water consumptions, um, you, you just mark the numbers itself and then select the right tag from the expert taxonomy, drag and drop it on the number itself. Usually you also need to provide some information on the unit, uh, like uh, uh, this is supposed to be a, uh, like a cubic meter, right? And on the period, reporting period. But this is how basically the tagging works. 
But as I mentioned, there's also another approach. While we have evaluated and had many discussions also with stakeholders and constituents uh, on this, we think that the expirate taxonomy could also be used in order to um, make uh, or, or to use a taxonomy centric report preparation process. So instead of first having the human readable report finally written, because this is actually the assumption when you tag and report. First, you, you have to have the final report, right? Uh, we think there is also an option to um, actually use the expert taxonomy as a template, yeah, or, or to, to use it to have a pre-tagged report. A pre-tagged report actually means it is already digitally tagged with the taxonomy, but is empty. So there are text boxes for each of the narrative disclosures and uh, the tables are provided uh, pre-tagged. Yeah? That is just an option that we think could be adopted by the market. Yeah? And um, then the actual preparer would fill in the information instead of tagging it manually. So there's a fundamental difference in the reporting process. And we think this approach is, um, is a valid uh, approach as well and should be uh, uh, actually done as well. I, I don't say it's a perfect solution for every uh, company and for every report preparation process, but it's definitely something thinking about and uh, there there will definitely be advantages in terms of effort, right? Uh, in terms of tagging effort, right? But the good news is, of course, the expert taxonomy enables both. So whatever approach is going to be used, uh, it will work. But keep in mind the tagging uh, exercise will uh, um, uh, will be harder if the report is not well structured in terms of the ESRS and in of the x ray taxonomy. Anything to add, uh, Andrea? Oh, good, great. Uh, we can uh, we can present the next slides on the same narrative elements, and uh, I I mentioned in the, in the previous examples of the digital transposition of the ESRS two SBM one. That we have also implemented the two additional element types into the taxonomy that are also called categorical and elements. Um, we have implemented these two that type uh, elements in the taxonomy because we 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 have considered that the benefit uh, of introducing uh, uh, these the booleans and enumeration in the taxonomy because we think that they contribute to uh, increase the level of comparability of the data and. Uh, this is the reason why we, we we invest a lot of time also in the in discussion about these elements and how to implement in the taxonomy. So where possible, we have converted some detailed requirements in the SRS into booleans or a yes, no, or true or false questions and enumeration, uh, which support the prepared to select uh, a, a choice from uh, a predefined list. Uh, so, in particular, for the booleans, uh, we invest a lot of time in the discussion, and we have classified, uh, as you can see in the box, uh, in the left uh, side of the box, uh, in three different uh, categories. So, the simple boolean that reflects the detailed requirement uh, uh, in a DR that are associated with the use of weather, and in brackets you can see an example where. Uh, in this case, uh, we have implemented uh, a specific Boolean uh, just to, uh, and uh, the prepared, they can select yes or no, true or false, if they have a policy or practice related to the sustainable land and agriculture. Uh, we have also uh, implemented the Boolean in case of conditional or narrative Boolean that reflects the requirement uh, in case of uh, positive or negative confirmation of some, uh, of some information. Again, here you can find an example in which instead of having a narrative disclosures uh, in case, for instance, of incidents, we have created a very simple element, a Boolean, just to, to, uh, to select yes or no if you have incident or not in the, in the period of the sustainability statement. And uh, uh, lastly, we have also created the Boolean for for what we named as technical Boolean in order to connect a different detail requirement. And this is, uh, of course, uh, to facilitate uh, the search filter associated with the relevant information. So in some case, uh, we think that is uh, very beneficial for the users uh, to understand uh, 
uh, from uh, simply from the Boolean. If, for instance, uh, we have some policies, some action, some resources that is uh, re uh, related to the, in this case, in the area of water risk. So they can easily identify this data, this data using uh, the, uh, the Boolean. For the enumeration, uh, um, uh, as I explained uh, um, before, we have uh, the enumeration is uh, uh, like a multiple is uh, like a, a, a choice from a, from a, a predefined list. We have two two kind of enumeration. One uh, is uh, like uh, a single choice from the from a list, or the other one uh, where uh, is uh, uh, in case it is compliant with the SRS, We have also implemented as a multiple choice, so you can select two three items in the list. And uh, and uh, appropriate to the to the disclosure requirement, uh, for instance, and you can see, and we can also uh, analyze in the in the detail uh, after we have also implemented the uh, the list of topics, subtopics, and some subtopics that are required under the application requirement 16 as a as a, an enumeration, in which, of course, based on the on the list of these elements, sub sustainability matters, you can then you can connect this list uh, with uh, the iron policy action targets and metrics. And in particular, uh, if you go to the others, I don't know if you want to say something, no, no. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, of course, uh, in the survey, you can find two specific question, uh, the uh, question 5A, uh, in which we ask if you agree with the implementation of semi narrative. And the, the and a specific question on the implementation of technical conditional booleans, as we explained in the dedicated section uh, session of the explanatory note. Just allow me one comment here. I think it's uh, it was very clear when we did interviews with the users, uh, uh, data providers, for instance, that those booleans are quite important for them. Um, because nowadays, as we understood how they work, is actually they often anyway read the disclosures and then uh, um, like compile the information into booleans of their internal systems anyway. So by providing the preparers a way to express their uh, yes or no disclosure already is of course uh, uh, very much appreciated by the users of the data. So we really think that's a good good chance and you find some a summary of the interviews in the appendix. And increase, uh, we, we hope that increase, of course, the quality of the data, because in this case there is uh, no another, another uh, entities that uh, will define if you have or no a policy. Exactly. And once again, now, a little bit practical because we are in a workshop. Um, let's have a tagging of the um, booleans and the enumerations. So the question is, um, uh, of course, because this tagging of uh, booleans in, in inline explorer reports is not yet common practice in the ESEF, so in the uh, tagging of the annual financial statements, um, we tested it uh, um, and it works quite okay. So this should not be a big issue for the preparers, technically, I mean. And um, it works like this. When you imagine a human readable report in inline x it is possible to mark one sentence that is actually having the positive or negative confirmation, right? It's not required to write actually yes, the term yes or the term no or the term zero or one or true or false into a human readable report. It can be a sentence, right? And in this case, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have an example. Um, it's a Boolean about if stakeholders have been involved in the target setting process. And uh, this can be tagged to this human readable report uh, by, by, uh, by putting the tag on the sentence itself that has this confirmation, right? And then in the XPRA software, it can be uh, chosen if it's actually a yes or no disclosure. Quite simple and works. And it keeps the link to the human readable uh, um, uh, sentence, of course. For the enumeration elements, it's uh, quite similar. So in terms of a predefined list, like a menu, right, that uh, options can be chosen from, uh, like in this case, uh, ESRS metrics used for the targets, um, we have provided a list of all the ESRS metrics. And then again, this can be tagged on the human readable 
um, a report and then the corresponding matrix can be used from that list. Keep in mind the list is way longer than those three items, so it's just here for illustration purposes. Also, we are not indicating how this needs to be done by each and every software vendor. There might be totally different uh, implementations, how it's actually be done, but this is uh, just to give you an illustration how, how it's technically possible to do that. Yeah. Good. Now let's come to a topic that is actually uh, quite interesting and quite important as well in, in terms of ESRS and also in terms of understanding the ESRS, especially ESRS2. And I hope we will not just add another abbreviation to your alphabet of uh, <laughs> things, uh, the term IRO. IRO. We are using it constantly and it means impact, risk and opportunities. And impacts and risk and opportunities are an essential part of the um, ESRS because the materiality assessment uh, defines those impact, risk and uh, opportunities and those need to be identified actually by each and every uh, company that is disclosing the um, ESRS and then be disclosed together with policies, actions, targets, and metrics. Sometimes we use the abbreviation PAT for policies, action, and targets. But uh, yeah, don't don't worry. It's uh, it's it's more like an internal abbreviation, I guess. Um, well, I'm I have a technical background, and when I first read the ESRS two, and I was thinking, okay, but how to model this technically? How to model the relationship between the IROs, the policies, the actions, the targets, and the metrics. And um, this diagram hopefully illustrates that there is a relationship. So starting with a materiality assessment and the topics, subtopics, and sub-subtopics on the very left, again, this is just an illustration, it's not a full list of all topics. Um, the the um, materiality assessment is starting by the identification of the impact, risk, and opportunity. So imagine a company has identified one impact, one risk, and one opportunity, and then they can connect their policies that they're going to disclose or not disclose because uh, there might also be uh, no policy. Um, but if they disclose it, it can be connected to an impact and risk and opportunity. Again, the same can be done for the targets and targets and action plans are uh, also connected uh, uh, to policies and of course the metrics, right? Um, a metric can be used in order to define a target or multiple metrics, right? This is quite quite clear when you think, for instance, of an example of a net zero target, then of course a few metrics are usually being used to measure if the target has been achieved and so on, yeah. Yeah, and this relationship between those uh, concepts is modeled in the Xray taxonomy. We have decided to model it with a soft link. So first of all, we provide a mechanism in the Xray taxonomy for preparers to digitally tag individual impacts, risk, and opportunities, policies, targets, action plans, and metrics, right? And uh, to connect them to the topics and subtopics. Um, we also provided a mechanism then to connect them in between, right? Those those lines that you can see between policies and IROs and so on. We did this with a so-called soft link. The soft link is very important because we think sometimes, uh, uh, for instance, if it's connected to multiple IROs, if a policy is addressing multiple IROs, then uh, it would be quite hard actually to model it with a uh, or complex to model it with a strict relationship. Therefore, we decided to implement soft links. Um, we have a specific uh, uh, chapter on this in the explanatory note and also an illustration of application instruction. Yeah, this is uh, uh, where we actually express how, how a guidance could look like or a rule could look like tagging rule on, on this specific aspect. Um, it's a little bit technical, so don't read that slide. Yeah, just uh, uh, if, if you want to, uh, um, you can, of course, uh, deep dive into the explanatory note. Uh, do you want to add anything? Uh, Yes, just if, uh, yes, on these slides, of course, uh, we have, uh, as uh, Richard explained, we modeled it in a flexible way. And if I remember correctly, for the IROS, we have also created uh, an enumeration because uh, we need to consider that m under m under the material assessment, uh, we, we have to consider the double materiality. So it can uh, one 
you can have an impact or you can have a risk and opportunity. So you have uh, we have created the specific elements in the taxonomy with enumeration. So when you identify a, a, an iros, you can also able to connect it in the name of this iro. Yes, it is only on impact. It can be in imp for impact, risk and opportunities. So you can have uh, you can select from a multiple choice and then you are able to connect uh, the policy action and targets and metrics to these uh, iros and to the list of subtopic, uh, topic uh, and uh, sub subtopics. In case you don't have, for instance, a policy, you can, of course, be able to connect even the action related to the iros. So uh, we have created this kind of uh, flexible uh, elements in the taxonomy. Exactly. Um, and just one thing that I forgot uh, to mention before, the topics and subtopics on the left are a little bit different from all the other concepts because this is actually a predefined list that we provided in the taxonomy, while the other ones are lists where we expect entities or undertakings to define their own uh, a IROS. A predefined process. with uh, an open uh, an open list because we have uh, other in case, of course, uh, you can have uh, different topics, a topic that are not covered in this application requirement 16. Exactly, that, that's right, yeah. Good, um, since this, especially from a technical uh, point of view, is a little bit tricky question. Um, we we put it uh, for expert, experts only, but everybody that feels uh, ready to be answering this question or just trusting us that we have uh, implemented uh, it correctly, um, you can find question 6a. Do you agree with the dimensional modeling, uh, uh, in particular with the implementation of type dimensions for IROS policies, actions, targets and metrics? Um, yeah, this is uh, the corresponding question in the um, survey and you can read chapter 6.6 .6 and A16 in our explanatory note to find the corresponding uh, description. Well, <clears throat> one thing is um, that the typed dimensions, and now this sounds is a very technical term, please apologize, that we have used for uh, uh, expressing or have allowing the tagging of uh, entity defined IROs policy and targets and actions uh, is a, the good thing about this is that it can also be used to express other entity specific and additional disclosures. And this is also one very important topic um, because the ESRS per se uh, requires or allows uh, entity specific and additional disclosures. Um, we modeled it into the XREL taxonomy as well. And now for those actually that have experience with XREL, we did this with type dimensions. It's at the very uh, top screenshot. The type dimensions are very effective and uh, um, uh, easy, simple way of expressing entity specific aspects in an XREL report. In contrast to XREL taxonomy extensions, this would be an, an option that we abandoned because it's uh, way more complex and from our point of view, the, the uh, type dimensions are equally powerful, but just very, very more simple to prepare in an expert report. And we have included two very specific um, expert sections in, in our taxonomy. One is on the entity specific uh, matrix. We have included um, expert elements that allow you even to disclose quantitative metrics and their values uh, using those type dimensions. Uh, in, for instance, if they are stemming from any other uh, legislation or generally accepted sustainability reporting standard or if they're just purely entities uh, uh, specific, right? And additionally, we have an uh, a section that we call other material or entity specific information for narratives in our um, Taxonomy, there we have a narrative textbook tag, disclosure of other material and or entity specific information. And both actually the matrix and the narrative element are equipped with um, an enumeration, so a drop down menu for each of the topics. So we provide the semantic meaning for this entity specific uh, um, uh, disclosure and a type dimension. And this actually even provides then more meaning to the users of the data and just having the information, this is entity specific, right? So um, at least it can be mapped to the topics and subtopics and sub subtopics. Yeah, and we think this is also key uh, um, for the users of the digital data. <clears throat> yeah, we have a corresponding question uh, in, in our consultation. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's question number seven. There is also one question uh, that is again for experts only. Um, it's for a technical challenge and now everybody non-technical, maybe uh, uh, yeah, just make a quick, quick break. Um, this this is about the optional disaggregations. In, in the ESRS, it is possible, uh, according to ESRS 1 paragraph 54, when needed, to disaggregate information by country, site location, and significant asset. And this relates to everything. So everything can be disaggregated by country. So, and then the question came up, how do we do this in the X-ray taxonomy? It's a technical challenge, right? And um, instead of putting the country dimension into every, every, every day to every data point, we just made a so-called open hypercube, please apologize the technical term, that allows you to randomly combine actually uh, dimensions. This is of course not the purpose, right? They should not be combined randomly. We will provide information which of the dimensions should actually be combined, but still we consider it uh, a workaround to tackle that one. All the expert experts that now hopefully listened, uh, please help us to provide uh, feedback on this specific question. Um, and all the other ones that took a, a, a quick nap, please uh, wake up, we can continue. <laughs> The next one is also uh, uh, an interesting topic because I saw a question already in the chat about mandatory tagging or mandatory data points, right? So our expert taxonomy not only contains definitions of the expert elements and data points, but also three validation rules. The validation rules are usually being evaluated from Xperia software tools when the report is prepared or analyzed, consumed, yeah? And those validation rules, they can have a different severity. We have three of those. One is on the EU data points, because according to ESRS 1 paragraph 35, undertaking she always disclose the information uh, 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 derived from uh, EU uh, legislation. So this is what we call EU data points. There are a number of legislations that are referenced in the ESRS. Andrea, which ones? Yes, yes, we have, we have an Appendix B and uh, there you can find all the data points that are related to EU, EU legislation, in particular to SFDR, so the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, Pillar 3, that is dedicated in particular to the credit institutions. Uh, we have also the Benchmark Regulation and the Climate Law Regulation. So all these data points are mentioned in the Appendix B and we have created a specific validation rule for these, uh, for these detailed requirements. Exactly, and um, it will basically, let, let's say it in, in, in human terms, uh, it will just pop up if such an EU data point is not tagged in an expert report. However, if an EU data point might not be material for whatever reason for that company, they can also tag it with XSE NIL, which is a very specific way of saying, I don't have it, I don't want it, uh, want to disclose it, right? So in this case, the validation will not pop up. So if it's actually deemed to be not material, then the validation will not pop up for this data point. But we consider it to be uh, very helpful for the uh, preparers and, and auditors, assurance providers uh, to have that uh, validation, of course. The next validation is um, about data points in the ESRS that are always to be disclosed. And we call that Internally, we have the term outside MA. It means not subject to materiality assessment. MA means materiality assessment, right? So according to ESRS 1, paragraph 29, undertakings shall always disclose the information in ESRS 2 plus IRO 1 in each topical standard. So this is kind of a list of mandatory data points in the ESRS. And we decided to put the severity warning here for each of those expert elements. That means if such an expert tag is missing in the expert report, a warning will be displayed, like this warning, yeah, giving the name of each of the elements, of course. And last but not least, we have a, a validation rule that is not actually resulting in any error or warning. It's just an information. The third one is an information when a metric is not being tagged that this is deemed to be not material. 
Yeah, so just think about this for a second. When a matrix is not being tagged, it is deemed to be not material. This is more like an information for the preparer that users might be interpreting this as deemed to be not material if it's not tagged in the report. And um, <clears throat> this is based on the paragraph 34B in ESRS 1. Yeah, we think that there are also, uh, that there should be more validation rules in the ESRS taxonomy, but due to the situation, resourcing and timeline, and uh, also the lack of real reports, we decided to just keep it with, with this, those simple three validation rules, but we heavily recommend that new validation rules and consistency checks will be added in the future in order to improve the data quality. And uh, yeah, we consider that very important. So uh, yeah, if you think that those validation rules uh, um, are okay and appropriate, um, please respond with yes in the public consultation. Well, and last but not least, um, we have two other questions in our public consultation, Q9 and Q10. Q9 is, do you have any other comment and suggestion? And Q10 is upload of technical attachment uh, to the survey responses. We welcome anything, uh, uh, yeah, just submit it to us. Even if you have nothing to say, uh, uh, it's also fine, just complete the survey. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Good. Um, we also promised, and that was the original idea, and I'm looking at Davide um, uh, in, in our team, um, to have an illustration how the digital tag ESRS statements can actually be used. Because what we have heard now is we have seen how to tag those reports. We saw the how narratives can be tagged, booleans, the two approaches about taxonomy-centric and tagging. And... <coughs> Now we also wanted to give you the opportunity to understand how it actually can be used by analysts and data providers. Imagine you have a sustainability statement like this one and it's fully tagged. Yeah? You have uh, 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 this nice looking report. Of course, you can first read it. It's human read. You can even print it or whatever. Uh, it's, I hope it's not done often, but uh, yeah. Um, this is how it looks like. The tagged information can be extracted by XBRL software and a an so-called data set, an extracted XBRL instance document can be generated from that human readable report. What you see here on the left is a human readable report and on the right, the XBRL instance document. Uh, it looks a little bit technical, but if you don't mind, we start with the second line. It has a direct reference to the taxonomy itself. This is the address of the taxonomy. Then you have some context information, like for which reporting period. And then below, you see the unique identifiers for water consumptions, including a unit like uh, cubic meters, uh, and then for the Boolean and also for the text. This is the XML format. It is also possible to export in JSON and in CSV. So for those of you that uh, prefer other two uh, formats than XML, this is also possible now nowadays with XML. And this document can, of course, be used um, by, by a data provider or by a user, indicated here on the left with a gentleman who is the preparer of the sustainability statements. ESRS statements and the lady on the right who is going to analyze the report and uh, uh, compare it with other companies. So imagine this uh, data set is being then sent and, and keep in mind always both is being uh, uh, published, right? It's one document that has a human will and the technical, but the lady can of course take the technical uh, um, uh, document, extract the relevant information, put it into a database, yeah, illustrated here with company D, this is just adding another company to her database, and then she can draw some diagrams and, and make analysis, and of course she will be happy. This is what we indicated with the hearts. And um, yeah, this is why we think the, the actual digital tagging of ESG information is key. It's very important the users of the data confirm that, uh, otherwise it needs to be read manually and the information need to be uh, uh, collected manually in the, all the human readable reports. And yeah, this is of course not the ideal way in the 21st century. Um, 
Regarding the process itself, let me, because I saw a few questions in the chat, let me elaborate quickly on the process of, it looks qu quite nice on the slide, right, how, how the reward is transferred. Um, right now in the EU, the companies, the large listed companies are uh, mandated to submit their digital tech report, which is only tagged for the financial statements, to the national OEMs, national OAM, sorry, national appointed mechanisms or like business registers. And from there, it is usually published on some web page. So that still means that now today, the reports need to manually be downloaded in each and every country from those web pages by the analysts. There is a project from ESMA, it's called the ESAP, the European Single Access Point. And this one will be a single point of a repository of all the digital reports and hopefully then it's no longer needed to go to each and every web page in every country to collect the reports yeah but uh, i i don't know exactly when it will be launched 2027 28 this is uh, the timeline we are living with um anyway we think that the digital tagging uh, is of course still already uh, relevant before that date right it even if we don't have a single repository, it still makes sense to digitally take. And uh, yeah, uh, just uh, sorry, before I forgot this one, we have two other ways also, for, I mean, very practical tips for you if you would like to play with the material that we provided, the tech illustrative reports and examples. Um, when you use the Arrayl tool, for instance, yeah, we don't keep in mind we are not advertising a particular tool, can be any Explorer tool, but this one is free and it allows you to export any table in the, such nice table view as David found out in Excel. So that is might be quite interesting for you to give it a try. Yeah. So with this tool, um, uh, the table export can, for instance, it, um, export this energy consumption disclosure in a nice Excel table. Uh, it also provides the so-called fact table via a plugin, as far as I understand, uh, that can export to XML, JSON, and CSV. And this one is actually the the pure data view, with having the uh, ID of each every each and every uh, element in the column B and the fact value, which is the value of each company, then in the column G. And this could be, for instance, in the Excel spreadsheet of the taxonomy, be used with a formula in order to render it back nicely in the uh, taxonomy structure. So this is just some tips for those of you that that have um, that would like to start uh, uh, using that data and play with the materials that we provided. Um, yeah, we heavily recommend that. Good. Last but not least, um, we would like to open the floor. I see you have provided many, many, many questions. I'm not sure if we will be able to uh, respond to all of those questions, but we will do our best now. Um, we have uh, half an hour to go, which is good. And this is actually not the slide I wanted to show. Ah, no, no, we have more polls. Sorry, Dean, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before we actually go to the question, we have a few more polls. Uh, maybe um, before we uh, uh, do that, uh, do you mind answering that poll? So <coughs> the first question is, which digital matters need more education and guidance from EFRAC? Um, that is interesting to see after our presentation. It seems to be taxonomy centric repropagation has quite some fans. But also IROS. Look at this, Andrea. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. I see a clear picture that we have. Uh, IROS, the core of the ESRS and, and uh, uh, minimum disclosure requirements on policies, action and targets is interesting and taxonomy centric report preparation. Thank you very much for this uh, 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 indication. Uh, in case you have selected other, if you have any other uh, thing that you consider important to be uh, um, uh, for EFRAC to issue more educational material, um, we provide the next uh, slide or poll. Um, where you can just type in anything. So just type in whatever you like and uh, uh, hit enter, then you 
uh, it will pop up in our word cloud, I hope at least. Um, <coughs> Let's see if we have any other topics that need more education and guidance. Auditing, yeah, interesting. Yes, there is two. You can, of course, like, I think, the other. Uh, uh, The question is if the audit aspect is actually related to the auditing of the XBRL or the general assurance of ESRS uh, statements, which is of course also an interesting topic. Materiality. Timelines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we saw that clarity. I hope we had a little bit of clarity from ESMA. But again, ESRS and IRO, Andrea. So we see this is. Uh, Key topic. Even the validation rules. Even the validation rules, yes. Also connected to the audit. Excellent. Double materiality is, of course, a very important topic, but keep in mind that this is, uh, we are focusing on the technical implementation, so this is not the key uh, 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 subject for our digital team to uh, provide uh, uh, information on that one. Yeah. Thank you so much for so much input. We will, uh, uh, of course, uh, see um, if we can improve our uh, or what we can do, actually. And now I think um, the final question is, um, are you going to use the draft ESRS Express taxonomy? And I hope very much that we get a lot of answers for the first question. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, you can check multiple multiple choice uh, whatever you like this is uh, very interesting it seems we have a lot of software windows product service assurance providers in the call uh, but i also very much like the second option because it seems we have quite a lot of uh oh now it changed um now actually users this is also good but also the third one shows that uh, people uh, like the idea of uh, preparing their esrs disclosures together with the x-ray taxonomy very interesting nice thank you very much for participating in that poll and now finally let's go for the slido questions andrea first question is it mandatory to file X xbrl for nfrd companies in 24 what is the level of tagging expected i've already replied in this case and uh... Uh, the NFRD doesn't require any any provision about the 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 tagging and the machine readable format, and uh, based on the new provision in the CSRD, the Article 29D that I mentioned at the beginning of the of this presentation requires the the you no know, the electronic format for the management report and and also the tagging of the sustainability reporting. So uh, this is, of course, uh, as uh, as Eduardo explained before, uh, then we need to also to understand from uh, HESMA uh, the process in order to incorporate to prepare the draft RTS and then to incorporate into the ESF regulation by the European Commission. So we don't know exactly when we expect uh, the XRL uh, sustainability reporting uh, on a mandatory basis, of course. Thank you very much. Um, as as once again, yeah, keep in mind that uh, uh, we are not responsible for the tagging rules. So uh, everything with, that we state here on this is uh, uh, yeah not act actually in our remit. Um, the same is actually also true a little bit for the question from France. Uh, thank you very much. Are there plans to define mandatory elements? Uh, similar to the financial reporting for the ESRS tagging, or is it necessary to take all ESRS disclosures? That's an interesting question. We have defined the taxonomy. We are not defining uh, the a set of mandatory tools, uh, text, I mean, expert elements, right? But keep in mind that um, uh, th that is a decision of F ESMA, actually. 
um, how it's got on and the European Commission, uh, how it's actually going to be mandatory. We think that, um, of course, it is not not as easy as, for instance, uh, with the financial statements where you have the primary financial statements, right? There is no primary financial primary sustainability statement in, in the ESRS. So it's not, not easy to make that distinction, right? But of course, as we have shown with the validation uh, rules, there are some mandatory uh, um, elements as per the standard itself, right? Not in terms of tagging, but uh, disclosures in, in terms of the standard itself. We think that the expert taxonomy is the most appropriate way to digitize the ESRS statements uh, uh, no matter what that actually means in in the report itself. So we consider, of course, the detailed tagging of the numerical values and the uh, 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 narrative granular text to be the most relevant ones. Yeah. I hope that clarified the, the question a little bit. Um, yeah, the next one is also very interesting, Svetlana. Um, in the ERS, no nested tagging, so every sentence only one tag is allowed to apply, no overlapping tagging. Again, we are not defining the tagging rule, but I would agree with you. Yes, as long as uh, it's the most granular tag that is being applied to the actual uh, tag, I don't see any need to have the parent tag, except for the level one, where, but where the purpose is not actually to have the text tag itself, but rather to have an indication that it exists in the report and for navigation purpose, right? So we try to reduce the overlapping tagging as much as possible, the need for that one. And given the granular text and non-overlapping text that we have provided in text taxonomy, we, we don't see a lot of need for those overlapping uh, texts, yeah? But this is also depends uh, on the preparation of the sustainability reporting. This is uh, quite important to underline because uh, if uh, the preparation uh, is uh, aligned, I would say, with the with the with the structure of the data that we have prepared in the taxonomy, of course, you reduce the risk of uh, you no know, creating uh, uh, or use many tags for the same sentence. Exactly. That's a very important point Andrea just uh, mentioned, right? Ima I, I will just repeat it in my own words, in simple words. Imagine that when data points or actual narrative disclosures are all mixed together in one page or in one paragraph, different data points, separate narrative disclosures are mixed in one text, then there might naturally be the situation that this different expired text need to be applied to the same paragraph because that person that drafted that paragraph did not pay attention to actually separate each and every disclosure, right? So that might be a situation where indeed it, it could happen. Yeah? That's why we think it's so important to, advoca uh, to advise uh, uh, preparers to um, uh, uh, use the taxonomy to structure the reports. Yeah. Very good point, thanks. Good. Will there be a uh, calculation link base in the future? Good question. So calculation link bases, for those of you that haven't heard it yet, is uh, they don't know it yet, is a um, way of expressing, <coughs> excuse me, um, calculational relationship between expert elements. And it's, let me, let me put it in simple words, you just provide how a table is actually calculated. So if you have total energy consumption, you can say total energy consumption is a renewable energy consumption plus non-renewable, right? Very simplified example now. But um, there's of course a whole hierarchy where that it can be expressed with this calculation link base. And we think it would indeed be very helpful to have this calculation link base as well in the ESRS taxonomy. Uh, right now, we don't have the the resources. We we thought that uh, we we first focus on the expert taxonomy itself and add it later. So I hope that we will have the chance to add the calculation link base later to indicate the the calcula calculational relationship uh, between the expert elements itself. How often do you anticipate the digital expert taxonomy changing after Q3? Well, that's also a very uh, interesting question. Um, I have no clear answer on this one yet, because um, uh, maybe in order to explain you how it works with other expert taxonomies, 
they are often updated, right? So at least once a year you have an update of the of the expiry taxonomy. Um, but we need to keep in mind that the ESRS taxonomy is reflecting the adopted delegated act. That means we cannot simply add or remove data points every year because it would mean there is another legislation. But if this is happening, of course, we would need to adjust the taxonomy. I'm not sure how this is in relation to adding validation rules, consistency checks, and maybe like additional guidance, additional quality improvements uh, to the taxonomy itself. Um, I hope there will be some opportunity also to introduce those uh, um, even after we have published the final X-ray taxonomy. But it's a good request. So if you think that would be useful, a good thing to do, please respond to the public consultation in question nine. Any other comment or suggestion? Please EFRAC update the taxonomy, improve the quality every year if needed. Yeah, Sometimes you maybe don't need to update it, uh, but I think it's a good idea. Also, it will be good after having the first real reports to see how it works. And if we discover things that are not working good, it's it's an IT mirror, right? That can always happen. Um, then we need to fine tune. Yeah. yeah, we need to consider that the real reports uh, also <coughs> depends on the progressive phasing that uh, no. So we have uh, uh, and depends also on the adoption of the final rule for the ESF no, regulation. Same question. Interoperability. From Jane, yes. Uh, will a bridge between uh, ESRS experience and ISSP experience taxonomy be developed? So um, a bridge is a nice picture. I like it because it's um, it's indeed something that we of course discuss as well. And there's also a chapter in our uh, um, explanatory note on the interoperability. As you might be aware, the ISSB, so the IFRS Foundation is, uh, and the ISSB have published an IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards and a related expert taxonomy. And the ESRS per se is uh, interoperable to a high degree to this um, uh, disclosure standards. So our assumption is uh, that uh, uh, 95 or even more of the data points are actually being reflected of the E1 in the IFRS S2 standard. Then the question is, of course, um, what does it mean from a technical perspective for the XRA taxonomy? Our vision that we have is that we, of course, reduce the need for preparers to do any double tagging. So first of all, it's important to understand European companies are mandated to tag with the ESRS taxonomy, right? But still, they might have some interest to do to for for whatever purpose to also enable compatibility um, with the IFRS sustainability uh, standards as two. So what we envision is that we develop uh, a mapping table that is able to um, map XPRL elements from our taxonomy to the one from ISSB, right? And in an ideal world, even an automatic conversion could be done from an ESRS uh, statement into an ISSB one. Keep in mind, the other way around will not so will not be so easy because the ESRS has way more data points than the uh, sustainability and way more Co topics. And considering right? also the impact materiality that uh, now we have uh, uh, we have in our ESRS, and uh, because of this, when we mentioned higher on the list of enumeration, we have created also this kind of uh, enumeration also to be interoperable with the ISSB. So to take into consideration that uh, it could be some uh, risk at opportunity that, that is also uh, uh, reported under IS, uh, IFRS S1 and S2. And of course, as Mariella uh, uh, pointed out, this is of course not only relevant for ISSB, because there are also GRI and CDP, for instance. So we are doing uh, similar exercises with the GRI, but it's a little bit different, of course, because there is no GRI taxonomy yet. So, um, but of course, there is an interoperability index with the GRI, and we will consider how we. Uh, achieve uh, digital interoperability with uh, GRI, um, um, CDP, and uh, of course NZDBU as well, the initiative from Bloomberg um, and Emmanuel Macron. And uh, yeah, this is an uh, interesting and uh, very important uh, topic for us as well. 
Let's go to the next question. Do we have any example of companies which have already started reported reporting in XRL? Yes. Um, statement, of course. <laughs> financial statements, indeed. So we don't, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, um, uh, uh, example for ESRS yet. Uh, maybe we have some voluntary tagging soon. That would be actually nice. But you can go to filings.xbrl.org. Maybe Davide, you can put that link in the chat. That's a repository of uh, publicly available annual reports tagged with XBRL. Keep in mind, not the, the the only the financial part is tagged, right? Not the ESG part, if it's even existing, right? But it's a good example to look at those um, uh, reports and and a very good experience, I guess. Please provide your viewpoint on how important it is to avoid using PDFs as an input for tagging. Well, yeah, this is something that is very technical again. Um, I don't think I will be able to elaborate on this now a little bit uh, um, uh, uh, in, in more detail because it's also very technical. So maybe we can have a um, discussion on that one uh, at a later point in time. So I think that PDF is naturally the format that is often chosen by preparers to to do the to publish the annual report, and it can also be perfectly tagged with an Express software. The only challenge is that when when there are a lot of na wide uh, narrative text block elements in the taxonomy, and then the the actual narrative disclosure will be rendered in an isolated database. Then the original formatting as it appeared in the PDF might not be exactly represented again. Sounds very technical probably to you and uh, it, it's also not a very big issue for most of the users, I guess. So, but it's still something that needs to be technically addressed, I guess, and the x community and the x specification uh, might uh, bring some benefit. In terms of ESRS, or some improvements there, yeah. in terms of ESRS, I don't see it's a big issue because the narrative, granular narrative text, will probably not span very multiple pages, so we won't have the issue of formatting a lot. Yeah. But it's again, it's very technical and maybe we can take that offline. Will the EFRAC documents include data points? VSME XBRL also be translated to in other languages? Maybe Andrea. German and Italian, so I don't know if uh, this is <laughs> for us to translate. You know, of course, we need to differentiate uh, <coughs> the data points in the VSME from the XBRL because, as we explained, XBRL will be incorporated into the regulation. And as you know, the regulation means that we need some kind of translation. We don't know exactly. It, uh, if it will be part of the HISMA remit or other things, but this is quite different from the from the implementation guidance on the list of data points, and uh, we have not uh, clearly at, at the moment discussed about uh, if we want to translate in other langu languages or the voluntary SME. So uh, that, of course, uh, is uh, even for the voluntary SME, they will not be incorporated into a delegated act. So they will be not uh, translated in the uh, in the in the other language, and the, as for instance, the list of the SME or the set one of ESRS. Thank you, Andrea. Um, there was also a question on SME. Uh, will there be an expert taxonomy for VSME standard? Do you want to elaborate on that one? Again, here we don't have, uh, there is no requirement uh, in terms of uh, legal requirement uh, not to uh, create uh, a machine readable format uh, and uh, marking up system for the VSME, for the, uh, for the SME. Uh, apart from the list of the SME that, of course, they are in the scope of the ESA for regulation. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, uh, we understand that, uh, and we are receiving a lot of, uh, you know, of inputs to create, uh, to implement uh, a taxonomy also for the, for the SME. So, uh, and this is, uh, we think that is quite important also in terms of, in consideration of the ESAP, ESAP regulation that uh, allows also uh, a collection of uh, voluntary also uh, information, even for uh, including also sustainability reporting uh, um, now released by by SME. 
my vision is, my personal vision, that we have a very simplified XBRL taxonomy, maybe even with a table link base that is questioner like, table like, template like, that can be used for voluntary SME. Very small, only the significant ones, depending on the standard itself, of course, right? But it would be definitely helpful in the supply chain to collect the corresponding information as well in the XBRL format and not to rely on any proprietary questioners that many companies are already issuing today. Uh, next question from Sabrina, what type of profile in an organization do you foresee as being responsible owner of this sustainable professional? I assume you refer to the tagging itself. Um, usually in the, my, my personal experience is that the tagging itself is best done either when it's done by the people that are responsible for the report itself. In terms of when you look at the financial reports, the accountants can do the tagging best because they know what's in their accounts and then they can decide which one, which tag is a appropriate one. For the ESRS, I think it might be similar. Yeah. There might be, of course, consultants that could also be able, specialized consultants, be able to do that, right? But naturally, I would really put it into the uh, reporting, sustainable reporting team, this responsibility of the tagging and not outsource it because, uh, yeah, that's that's where it belongs, yeah. Um, but it's just just in my personal opinion. Yeah. I agree. I totally agree with, the, with your comment. Could you please demonstrate the soft tagging I wrote to policy, for example, how it would be done? <laughs> I see. So first of all, the, the, the sample reports that we included uh, in uh, that we showed today, those can be found in as an appendix to the public consultation, non authoritative right? We are not consulting on the sample reports, but you can find them there. there are, I didn't show anything more that we just published for download purposes to you as well. So please have a look at those. But seeing all the questions and all the interest in the IRO, maybe we should fine tune our sample yes. taking and provide a more more fruitful, uh, more more richful uh, example because right now it's only very technical and it's not having real content. So I really hope that we will have the chance also to have a more a realistic example of the tagging. Uh, but of course, it's a it's a matter of uh, resources as well. Yeah. Uh, would it be better to develop a special software with full package of necessary information, data points, proposals of, uh, I think, targets, metrics, and actions? Um, the market is free to do that, right? The XBRL format is free and open to use. The XBRL taxonomy is free. You can download it. It's uh, no issue. Anybody can do whatever uh, he or she likes doing with it. So if there are vendors interested in, in making innovative approaches and solutions, software, whatever, they're welcome to do that. Yeah. So, uh, But the taxonomy itself is a great vehicle to express what we want to express and we don't go any further. IFRAC will not provide any tool. Yeah. Is there more detail on policies, targets, and action plans? Taxonomy makes it seem like these are tabular, but in the draft report, they are paragraphs. Well, um, <coughs> yeah, this is actually true, right? Um, the expert taxonomy allows you to separately identify individual policies, targets, and actions. Um, this could also be, of course, omitted, right? If a preparer would like to mix it all together, it could be done as well with a, with a flexible yes, taxonomy. Yes, yeah. but uh, of course, uh, we have created uh, this uh, tabular module uh, because uh, we have also the minimum disclosure requirement in which uh, there is a specific, uh, there are a lot of specific and detailed requirement uh, uh, for policy action targets and, uh, and uh, we have uh, created uh, this uh, table of format in order to be also compliant with the requirement of uh, the minimum disclosure requirement uh, under ESRS 2. And just to add on this, the expert format does not force, in the inline expert, does not force any kind of presentation. Preparers and companies are still free to present however they like it, in a tabular form, in a list with bullet points or whatever. It's it's still possible. We are not forcing any representation. The tables are not mandatory. It can be presented very differently. 
uh, this is just a suggestion and, and the expert taxonomy is free in, in terms of presentation. Yeah, so this is very important to understand. Do export packages be merged for non-financial and financial parts in the report? Ah, yeah. I think the question is actually more like, will it be a separate report? Uh, I think no. The ESRS is supposed to be disclosed in the management report uh, or being part of the management report. And the management report is being part, we just looked at this uh, uh, before. The annual report uh, for the listed companies. So yes, yes. For listed, uh, of course, uh, there will be parts of the annual report. We need to analyze better for the large corporation that are not listed. Exactly, but for the listed ones, we can say for sure it is part of the management report and therefore part of one ESAF XPRA report package. There might be some technical ways of separating the tagging, but in I think it will be just one XPRA taxonomy from issued by ESMA that is uh, having both the accounting taxonomy and the um, ESRS taxonomy for the large listed companies with IFRS and it will be in one report package. <coughs> the next question is on the tagging at the level two or level three. Can a report be only at the level one? So in this case, I think that we have not created any tagging rule. <laughs> we have just created the three different levels. Mm, no. And exactly. Uh, we can only say that tagging on level one only would be a very limited use for the analysts of the data, right? So level one would provide the information, yes, this disclosure requirement is in the report and maybe also the page where it can be found, but it does not provide the granular data yeah. points that are defined in the ESRS. So that would be a drawback, right? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Good question from Stephen. Uh, it's more of a question of for Eduardo. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> Eduardo. But is it still in the meeting? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, will there be a possibility for extension? This is an interesting question. Um, XPRL taxonomy extension are a way to also express entity specific disclosures. And yes, in theory, the ESRS XPRL taxonomy could be extended. However, the way how we have modeled it, given all the mechanisms we included to take entity specific information, there's no need actually to create a taxonomy extension. So yes, it could be done, and when it is done, we have a very specific way of recommending it, but it is most likely not needed in many cases. So we minimize the need for text on extensions. Andrea, we have, I think, reached... Uh, yeah, there is another the question on the, the last question. Do you expect an effect of it on your timeline related to the outcome of the triple D? Uh, so on the corporate sustainability, to diligent directive. <coughs> Our work is based on the CSRD, and uh, so that requires uh, a machine readable format and marking up, and uh, there is no connection. We don't see any connection with the C, uh, CS triple D. Thank you very much. Let's leave it with this. I think we uh, uh, had many, many questions. We liked that very much. Thank you so much for joining. Maybe we will try to stay a little bit online and answer by typing the answers to the question. It was a pleasure to have you. I hope you liked the, the uh, workshop and the webinar. Please respond to the public consultation. That would be a big favor for us. And yeah, have a good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you for uh, this presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>